participating in this interview as a small contribution to International, International Women's Day 2014. The aim of this project is to give us an opportunity to communicate with inspirational female leaders within the UN system. We hope these interviews can be a tool to empower young women like us who will be inspired and motivated to achieve successes by the example of yourself as a role model. This supports the theme for this year's International Women's Day, Equality for Women means Progress for All. We are excited by the opportunity to talk with leading women at the very top of the UN system in order to gain insight into how they achieve their positions of leadership and to learn about their experiences and challenges in doing so. My name is Elizabeth Isaac. I am 15 years old. I'm currently studying at Blackheath High Senior School. My name is Lauren Paku and I'm 11 years old and I'm currently studying at Blackheath High Junior School. My name is Janvi Singh and I'm nine years old. I study at Blackheath High School Junior School in London, UK. Good. Nice meeting you. You too. Thank you. I'm Judy Cheng Hopkins and I'm the head of the Peace Building Support Office here in the UN in New York. So maybe we should start. Would you like to ask your question? Yes. yes. That would be great. Yes. Thank you. My first question to you is, what is a typical working day in the life of Judy Chang Hopkins and what is your favorite part of your job? Okay, so um, we work here in headquarters in New York. So, so you have to bear, bear in mind this is a headquarters setting. So a lot of times, unfortunately, are spent in meetings because that's what headquarters do. Uh, so I'm either going for a meeting or I'm, uh, sometimes I actually leave, leave the, uh, the UN and actually go talk to students. I make speeches, I make presentations to, to other groups, to community groups as well. But, um, but the other part of my job, which is a lot more interesting, I must say, is uh, in the field. You know, then the headquarters, basically, we're with member states, we're sitting in the General Assembly, the Peace Building Commission, etc. But a lot of the real work happens in the field, in countries that are, you know, in, in crisis, countries coming out of conflict. I'm sure you, you know of these countries, the Somalias of this world, the Liberias, the Sierra Leones of this world. That's where our work is, is, is needed most, and that's where it's the most exciting. So, um, so yeah, so my, you know, my, uh, my, my high points are when I actually go to visit these communities that we're trying to help, and to hear from the people themselves how they feel that their lives are, are, are better or in fact sometimes worse and, and how we can you know discuss and, and come up with solutions together and what can be done. That is the most satisfying part of my job. So is that your favorite part? That's my favorite part. My favorite part is actually talking to people who you know so it's not some abstract thing that you're reading in the report you know there's not only so much you can get from reading a report. You have to have face to face. You have to look the woman in the eye, the woman you know who's lost her husband and, and, and her child, and, and is really trying to survive in this in this environment. And you know, and what can we do? Can we bring in some livelihood activities? Can we help train her? Give her some micro credit so she can start a living. You know, that that is is what is most satisfying about this job. Right. My second question to you is, what is it like to be a woman working for the UN across countries with different cultural expectations of women? That, that's a very interesting one. You know, again, um, there's both headquarters and the field. So I want to be very clear. We're talking from the point of view of headquarters, New York. But a lot of what goes on goes on in the countries that, are, that we are, we're helping. So in New York, of course, it's a different thing. You know, it's like in London. Um, you know, people have come to accept women in, in high-level roles, and and the Secretary General of the UN has made affirmative action a very strong legacy of his. You know, to the point where now women in senior positions are 
you know, a very, very common place. And I, I don't know the statistic today, but it's very high. It's definitely higher than it was 10, 20 years ago when to see a woman um, in a high level position is truly rare. It's truly rare, not today. So that, that is headquarters. Now on the field, again, depending on what country you go, you're going to, uh, people's attitudes towards women change. So um, I just want to tell you a funny story. You know, in certain cultures, men do not shake the hands of women. So even though I may be the most senior person, I may be the one bringing millions and millions of dollars, my hands are not the ones they shake. They shake the hands of others around me who are men, you know, who, um, who are probably in less uh, uh, critical positions. Uh, so one day, um, I, I actually uh, pulled aside a certain gentleman from one of these cultures and said, um, you know, look, nobody, nobody is looking, and it really means a lot to me for you to shake my hand. Will you shake my hand, please? And he did. So, so it's something I, I laugh about. It, it did, we joked about it, and I don't know, maybe sometimes we have to be, you know, my style of working both in the office and outside is pretty informal. I, I like to, to, be, to be very human, talk to people in a very frank manner, and I like to inject always a sense of humor, you know, because I, I really think it's so important, you know, not to, be, not to take yourself so seriously. Yes, I take myself seriously, but not to the point where I think it interrupts with what I'm trying to do. So in this kind of a case, by sort of asking what I ask, look, nobody is looking, sir. Why don't you shake my hand? It means a lot to me. You know, so, so that breaks the ice with him. You know, and maybe we ought to be doing things sometimes a little bit non-traditional like that you know, for this world to get along better. I agree. Very, very good answer. Um, what was life like when you were in high school? And when you were in high school, what was your dream job? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not the model, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't listen to me on that one. I wasn't the model high school student. I was not a very good student. I was a little bit cheeky and naughty, so I always got in trouble. But I suppose the good news is, um, you know, when, when I do talk to people, to students in school, that that it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's not over, it's not too late, because eventually the day will come when you meet a teacher or you, you, you come across a, a topic and subject that's so exciting and so riveting and, and you want to learn more about that particular subject and the teacher is so good and the teacher pushes you further and you want to learn more, that's, that's when the change happens, you know, from, from you know, going to school and, and you know, and, and being bored sometimes by lessons. I think, you know, and that's why I think teachers are so important. You know, the students are important too. You have to be motivated, but the teach, teacher is the one that can light that fire in you. And when that happens, I think um, then, then you change. And, and then you start, you know, you start gravitating towards uh, the, the subjects that interest you and you want to learn more and read more. And, and so, so just because I was not a very good student early on because I was not excited by the topics, but later on was turned on by it, uh, means that there's hope for everybody. Even the bad, stu even the bad students teachers. amongst you. Sorry, yeah. yes? <coughs> yeah. I think you're absolutely right. Sorry, Laura. Who inspired you when you were in school and who inspires you now? Um, I, I was, um, you know, depending when in school, of course, in my high school years were, were the years where I wasn't, as I said, the model student. I was always the cheeky one. I was getting in trouble. I was even thrown out of school once or twice, but I managed to, to talk my way back in, or at, le at least my parents talked my way back in. And, and then, as I said, uh, uh, you know, when I started being really interested in topics, so would you believe, even though I'm sitting in this job I'm sitting in now, what really turned me on was Shakespeare. You know, when I started studying about Shakespeare, about, about, about life back then, about power and what power does to people, you know, that, that intrigued me. And maybe that was the beginning of my interest in politics, you know, from, from Shakespeare, really. So that, that changed everything. So that, that was, as I said, the early days. But in the lady day, later in university and in, or in college or in university, you know, I, I grew up in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the 70s, you know, when the women's liberation was just about starting. I'm sure you've read about it. So um, I think what really, um, who I really admired were, were women because it's so rare in my day, it was still rare in my day to have women speak up very articulately, very self-confidently, assertively, you know, uh, not rude, not, uh, you know, but, but really assertively and confident in what they say and very articulate 
and, and really, um, you know, and, and, and facing men, uh, you know, in a room and, 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 and having these positions, you know, that really, um, I was so impressed by that. And, and especially also when women, you know, again, in my day, uh, you know, when women were serious, they were meant to be, uh, you know, you know, very serious looking, you know, dressing very conservatively, you know, and th they were the ones considered the, the, the intellectuals and the smart ones. But in my time that I was, I was um, you know, coming of age, it started changing. Women didn't have to be that way. Women could look good. A woman could look sexy and still be intelligent and speak in a very articulate manner. So my professors that were in that mode, I had one particular professor, actually she was British. She is British. Um, you know, was, was uh, one of those very outspoken ones, but so smart, and I learned so much from her. But yet, she was no, so non-conventional. She smoked a cigar, and she dressed really, really nicely. And so I, re I wanted to be like her. And that's all I can say. She sounds great. <laughs> As young women, we are taught to be resilient. Can you tell us of times when you, ha when you have had to be resilient? How do you deal with sad and upsetting events and overcome setbacks? What is the best of advice you have ever received? Yes, of course, um, you know, when you've been in, in a career as long as I have, would you believe this is my 36th year working in the United Nations? Um, 36th year. So I've been, I've had a long, long career and no doubt about it. Anybody who has had a long career would have had setbacks, would have done stupid things, would have done wrong things, would have put herself in a, in a stupid situation and, you know, so, so, so have no fear. That happens to everybody. So even you in, in your young lives, in school, I'm sure occasionally you've said something wrong, you've done something wrong, and you realize the key is to realize it and to accept it. To realize, accept it, you know, internalize it, sit back, think about it. You know, should I have said that? Uh, wouldn't it have been better if I had said that instead? You know, should I have um, consulted with this person? Should I have asked this person what he or she thought? Should, should I, you know, so, so be, be a bit retrospective, you know, sit back and, 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 and sort of go through the, that scene, that scenario. Because believe it or not, um, you know, we have a funny way of internalizing things. You know, that's what we call lessons learning. So you learn from these moments in life and not necessarily completely. So you might still do another stupid, uh, uh, something silly, um, even a few weeks later. But, but you, you continue internalizing and, and talking to yourself of how I should have done this, how I could have been uh, better at this, how the other person would have been less offended or felt better about it. And, and in the end, we would have achieved the same thing. We would have you know, come up with a better solution to do something, and everybody would have felt good about doing it. So I think the more you do that kind of um, you know, self-reflection and thinking and, and, and learning from your lessons, you know, the, the more you're going to, to, to thrive in life. Um, thanks very much. Uh, one of our learning pillars at Black Youth High School is enterprise. What advice would you give to girls at school on how to succeed on the world stage to help the global community? Yeah, that's um, obviously that's very, very relevant to our jobs here in the UN, you know, especially uh, us trying to, to help countries that are in conflict or coming out of wars. You know, that's, that's my job, to help countries coming out of wars. So for you, uh, the advice is I would say, um, you know, you must be passionate about whatever you're going to be doing in life, either <coughs> in the short term or even your careers in the longer term. You know, I knew back then, I knew back then when I was your age that, uh, and, and, and this may not be true for you, so please don't take what I say as if this is true for everybody. This may not be true for you, but I knew for myself that I didn't want to be a banker. I didn't want to look at numbers all day. I wasn't interested in the stock exchange, even though my parents were. You know, I, I was interested in reaching out to communities and talking to communities and seeing how, how we can help them and work with them together and problem solve together. You know, you know that, that was what, you know, made me passionate about something I did. So, so I would read about it. I wanted, you know, go out and, and be better at it each time I, I do these things. So, so my first advice to you is, 
you know, whatever it is. And some of you, you know, I'm not putting down being a stockbroker, believe me, or a banker, you know, but the key is you must be passionate. You must love what it, what it is that you, you want to be doing later in life. You, you must be passionate about it. You must be true to yourself. You, you cannot be untrue to yourself. You know, you, you, you may be untrue to yourself for a day or two, but eventually it's going to catch up with your own internal mind and your brain that, hey, this is not what I want. That, you know, who said this is what I want to do? Life, you know, is very important. I want to be doing something that, that, uh, that I, I can really live with and, and, and I can, you know, be proud of. So, so that passion, uh, when it hits you, I don't know when it's going to hit you, but, you know, I would imagine in the next few years it'll hit you that this is your area of interest and this is what you want to be doing. So, um, so the first advice is, um, you know, be, be, be truthful to yourself, be honest to yourself that this is what I love doing uh, and I want to be doing this for the rest of my life. And so, um, yeah, so, so I think that's the first, if at your stage in life, I think uh, that's what you have to, you, you're going to have to grapple with. And uh, eventually you're gonna come out of it with something that you, you really enjoy. Thank you for those wonderful pearls of wisdom. Um, we've got time for one more question. As our global resources diminish, will we be able to achieve and keep any kind of peace, do you think? Yes, I, I think, um, you know, um, one can argue whether global resources are diminishing, you know, are, are diminishing. Uh, just as we thought that water resources were diminishing, now they're finding all this un underground water in so many parts of Africa. You know, just when we thought that America was too dependent on oil, America now has um, producing more natural gas than ever. So it seems that, um, you know, um, uh, maybe resources are not so much diminishing, but diminishing, but more uh, our use of it, not to be wasteful about what we have. So, so that's the one debate. But, but you're right, though. There is a link to to war and peace. That a lot of times when war breaks up in a lot of countries I deal with, mainly in Africa, it's it's over resources. It's if everything from water, you know, for, for herdsmen, for people with animals that, that are herding uh, cattle, you know, the, the fight is over water resources. From, from that end of the continuum to the other end, which is a lot of countries that are rich in minerals and gold and, and, gold and diamonds, you know, being controlled by a very small minority and the majority living in, 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 uh, in, in, in poverty and in, in abject poverty is something that again causes so much resentment that fuels fuels this anger and, 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 and the conflict that we see in so much of the world today. So yes, yeah, so um, one has to be mindful of it, but, uh, but on the other hand, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also, I have to be optimistic because I'm in this business of trying to build peace. So if, you know, uh, obviously I must believe in what I do. And I really believe that um, when you get the equation right, when, you know, eventually, eventually all warring parties, you know, as we see throughout time, will lay down arms. People cannot go to war forever. Eventually, you know, there's such a thing of being tired of war. And so uh, people are ready then at that moment to talk about peace, you know, how our life can be better. And that's when we come in to sort of push a little bit uh, this, this more optimistic thinking so that people again can then put, put the differences together and, and work together towards a better, a better future for, for their children especially. Thanks very much. I believe that's all the time we've got. Um, so you've given some really brilliant answers. Um, and You really helped us yeah. in learning what we would like to know from you. So thank you very, very much. Thank I, you. I'm very happy and I'm very happy to talk to you and, and I really wish you the best for a beautiful, beautiful future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Bye. 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 Bye.